Hey everyone, and welcome to the show, The Paleo Post Podcast. On this episode, Genevieve and I will be reviewing some of the most important, new, and exciting topics relating to paleoanthropology and the field in general. Each week, we'll be going on air to help teach and educate the science surrounding human origins as it's being done. So get ready because your weekly Paleo Post is here. Woohoo! <laughs> I, I know we have cheer. to start out with that. We have to start out with that, or the episode hasn't started yet. That's like how I know. That's how I know to go. <laughs> I can't help it. I get excited. <laughs> it's, like, it's a good intro. You do, I like it. I, I feel like it just needs a punctuation on the end. It's the exclamation. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. So here so we are. Three, We're back. Yeah. Three um, more stories. Ready yes, to go. Three more stories ready to go. Yes. So, and, and we've got a new continent again this week where I feel like we're always like traveling the world. Like, you know, we're like, and, you know, last week we were in Spain and Africa and like, you know, this week we flipped the globe around and yep, North, America. In North America. So this yep. week for our episode to start out, we're going to be talking about White Sands National Park in New Mexico in the United States. This might sound familiar to you because I believe... Was it two years ago already, or was it last year? It was definitely a lot. It was, it was, it was a year-ish ago. I feel a like year-ish ago. A year, maybe a year and a half, somewhere okay. in that range. There were footprints discovered, human footprints, homo sapien footprints, because for anyone who does not know, the only species of hominin that has been in the Americas is homo sapiens. No Bigfoot, yep. no, no anything else. Oh, um, come on. <laughs> Sasquatch? I am not a Sasquatch believer, no. Fair enough. <laughs> um, as so much as I love Jane Goodall, I can't get past the fact that she thinks it's possible, but that's a whole nother story. Anyway. Right? Anyway. So their footprints were discovered, regular sized footprints yep. in the <laughs> in the sand, and they were dated uh by I believe one lab to about twenty to twenty three thousand years ago. Now, th this, this date, huge. this this is huge, because yeah. even though most researchers at this point have completely thrown out the um, Clovis first idea, and even mm -hmm. the more horrible Salutrian idea, you know, these... Awkward. Uh, yeah, <laughs> awkward. Um, you know, we've known humans have been in the Americas for a long time. I think yep. one of our first episodes, we talked about sloth Brazil in Brazil, yeah. which yes. when was the date for that? It was, it was like 30,000 ish. Yeah, it was 30,000 ish. So, I, so of course, you guys need to realize that's farther down, which means you have to get there first. Way farther, like thousands oh. of miles. Yeah. yeah. So, and, yeah. And they weren't doing it like with intention. It's not like they were like doing the you know, some sort of hiking trip where they're like, right, we must cover this many kilometers per day. In order exactly. To they're probably following game or following something. Meandering. Yeah, yeah. meandering. Yeah. So yeah. while it is important that we have established, well, so let's continue. So there was a lot of controversy surrounding these dates because people yeah. wanted to see uh, more definite dating done. They didn't believe it. They didn't think it was possible. Humans were there at the time you know, despite all the other sites. But so we got new dating last week yeah. or the week before. Actually, it was it was this week. It was three days ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, confirming the 20 to 23,000 year old time frame that these footprints in the white sands were created by Homo sapiens, by indigenous Americans in yep. North America. And so, of course, it doesn't mean this was the first time people were in the Americas, as we talked about. Oh. But it's just, it's another nail in the coffin, or better better yet, another post-it on the board of what story yeah. of the Americas is. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it, it's, you know, again, it's one of those ones where, I mean, I think we've talked about this before. There's a lot of sociopolitical stuff, I suspect. Yes. They have also been impacting things, which just weren't an issue in Europe, and they haven't been an issue in other parts of the world. And so, I mean, I think, I think that has, like, sometimes I think the stories we create around this um, are, are more stories that are convenient for the time or the place. I mean, think about even the idea of, like, art being invented in Europe 35,000 years ago, right? Right. Like, that was convenient for a narrative 
from like the late Victorian era, early, like, you know, and it like from like the sense of, well, art was invented in Europe. And so, so I think sometimes these stories, it's, but stories are hard to get rid of sometimes. And, and so I think this is where in, in the Americas, you know, if you can step back and kind of like wipe the stories out and think about the fact that during the ice age, the whole Northern hemisphere was one massive continent, basically, like in the sense that, it, it, you know, from the, the Asian side, it literally was a huge swath of land that came across, like Siberia just continued. <laughs> yeah. And Alaska yeah. came out to meet it. And it was one enormous tundra that literally spanned, you know, from the UK, Doggerland, because the UK right. wasn't even an island then, it was part yeah. of mainland, like literally from the UK all the way through to the far side of America. Like, well, the Americas, like, so literally all the way across one enormous swath of land. And, and it wasn't a one-way street. Right. People would have been going, they would have been going, you know, but, and why, if we've got ancestors turning right and heading down to Australia. <laughs> why, why wouldn't why they would turn left? Ancestors, right. And, yeah. and go that way. Like, so I think it's almost more one of those where in the future, when people will look back, they'll be like, why, why was this even like a, a thing? Like, isn't, isn't it just logical? So I think it's more that what we're doing is we're digging our way out of our stories and, and, and that these are the pieces of the puzzle that are helping us to create the new story of, of being like, oh, well, of, of, why would people be here? Like, it would make absolute sense. But then we want to know, when did they come? What were they doing? Where did they live? What did they do? So it also opens up this beautiful new part of the world for us to learn about their very deep history stories. Absolutely. Um, but now, these footprints if I'm correct, they were sediment from the edge of a lake, right? So I think for our listeners, just to kind of, so the way these things happen, because it seems wild that footprints survive for, right. for like thousands. Yeah. Thousands. Right, I mean, right. look at like, you know, right, or millions of years even. Um, in this case, though, I believe it was that they were walking along the edge of a lake or some sort of water system, and they left the impressions in the silt and that kind of thing, and it filled up and left their footprints intact, I believe. I think I'm correct with that, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so that's, yeah, isn't that crazy, everybody? <laughs> that people can, that Next time you walk on that beach at low tide and you your footprints get covered up, maybe yours too could survive. I know. I always, whenever I'm at the beach, I think very intentful footprints. <laughs> Ooh, see? You're planning ahead. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, planning I'm ahead. Future, future paleontologists. <laughs> um, so, well, I think, though, the neat thing, though, is that they, they actually use complementary dating methods this time, too, with yes, the footprints, yes. which you and I had sort of talked about might be a fun opportunity to talk a little bit about um, how do we know how old a footprint is, for heaven's sakes? Because, like, a footprint's a negative space, right? <laughs> like, right. there's no foot left in it. It's just an impression left. So, which, how do we what do we call those? We, we talked about this in a previous episode. What do we call these? Uh oh, I forgot. What is it called? They're called trace fossils. Ah, oh, trace They're fossils. They're a, a quote unquote fossilization of a behavior. So we're seeing a footprint, Ooh. someone making a step, someone doing something, and that is yep. fossilized. So, yes, and how, how on earth do we date this? Right? Yeah, because it, so this is where I believe they originally did it with some seeds that they found in the yes. layer, I think was what they did. And I believe that would be carbon dating, of course. And then this time, though, from what I was reading, they used pollen, and then they did more carbon dating, and then they also did optically stimulated luminescence. So let's talk about OSL for a second, and then we should talk about calibration. Calibration is interesting. Yes. Um, okay, so OSL stands for optically stimulated luminescence, and it's basically measuring the last time those grains of sand or sediment saw the light. And the light gets trapped inside like the little matrix of their their little tiny their little tiny rocks. And then you take it into the lab and you shoot a laser at it and it makes it release <laughs> its <laughs> light. And you can count, you can measure that to figure out how long it's been storing that light inside its little crystalline matrix. So it's it's an amazing technique. And yeah. so it works in sand, it works in all sorts of these environments, but you need something that would have previously seen the surface. Right. Um, so it would have previously needed sunlight and the sunlight would have activated and been stored inside of it. So um, that gave really solid dates around 20 to 23,000. And then, of course, we have the pollen and we have our carbon dating, 
which um, do you want to explain carbon dating to our listeners? I mean, just really briefly. Yeah. So carbon dating is probably the most common form of radiometric dating. And the way that carbon dating works is you need to know a little bit about chemistry and how isotopes work. So every isotope and every, they all have a half-life. Okay. And that is how long it takes for that particular isotope to disappear within the molecule. So let's take carbon, carbon-14. You have wood. You can measure how much carbon is left in that wood by how much has disappeared, i.e. how many half-lives have passed. Yeah. Carbon, most isotopes and atoms can be measured to about five or six or seven half-lives. And carbon goes back about 45,000 years. However, recent advancements such as uh, one of my guests on the show, Dr. Tom Hyam, who until recently was the head of the Oxford. Um, oh, he's like a C-14 boss. Yes, he is. He, <laughs> if you need to know anything about carbon dating, he is the guy you go to. So my yep. basic knowledge and what I know about carbon dating, a lot of it comes from talking with him. He has pushed his lab to getting dates as far as 55,000 years that are accurate. That's wild. Well, I think so. Every time you get a half life, literally only half of it is left. So yes. half of it breaks down and is gone, and you only got half of your sample left. So the problem and then is half is more, that, and then half more, and then only a half. And so, and so you end up. And the problem is you get to these teeny, teeny, teeny little fractions that are left. It's really easy for them to get contaminated. Yes. Like God forbid you should sweat on it, or modern people touch it, or it gets contaminated right. with modern carbon because then it completely screws it up. And since so, carbon is everywhere everywhere we all it's something it. very hard to avoid yeah. and that's why yeah. you see i don't know if anyone has seen um a very good example because he's in a lot of documentaries where they're doing things like this is Svante pavo in his lab they're all uh-huh. geared up and all their their white um oh the bio suits i like bio bio suits. Suits. i feel more official I feel i've more... worn one before because <laughs> i don't sweat <laughs> on the sample right don't but, you know, you... sweat Oh. You have to be so careful. I mean, they're dealing yep. with DNA, which is a whole nother level of having oh, yeah. to be careful. But yeah. even when you're talking carbon. about carbon, it's still yeah. very easy yeah. to contaminate. Yeah. And then I just really briefly, we don't want to go too we don't want to go too far down travel hole <laughs> because we could go a long way. But I just wanted to point out for people when they see the words calibrated, calibrated C14 in an article, what does that mean? So basically, carbon, what we're measuring is is Again, carbon's not laid down in the environment exactly evenly every year in the sense that things can alter it a little bit, like say volcanic eruptions or other things can slightly change the average amount of carbon in our world in any given year. And so what we need to do is we need to compensate for heavy carbon years or light carbon years to make sure we're, we're getting the dates right. And I think we've done a lot of it with dendrochronology, right? Like yes. We've used it. Yes. yes. So so now we get to talk about, oh my gosh, we're like fully nerdy. I know. This is... I'm wearing my glasses. I wish people would see me pushing my glasses <laughs> up my nose with so much joy. I'm surprised there's um, a tape in between here, you know, right here. <laughs> it's happened. Um, it's happened. But, uh, <laughs> so, but, you know, so dendrochronology is using tree rings, which blows my mind. So this is like, we literally have a continual tree ring record that goes back like way into the Paleolithic now. And and it's almost like this amazing thing because you have to compare it and you got to find, because again, tree rings are thicker or thinner depending on the conditions of that year. But we can look at the whole sequence of thick and thins and we can literally match them up with other trees that are slightly older or slightly younger, find the same pattern. And we've been able to create this continuous line of tree ring knowledge that goes all the way back and then what you can do is carbon date that particular tree ring to get the date from it yeah and and so it's it's wild so we can use that to even out any any differences that may have existed in the carbon in years and often the calibrated dates so now there's these whole huge lists you can go to it's really cool it's even a place online i use it when i want to do stuff where you can literally type in the old carbon dates from like the pre-calibrated era and it will fix them for you it will calibrate them, which is oh, really, really that's very cool. useful. So, super useful. I think it's called Oxcal. I think there's a couple of them I've seen that. Is it from Oxford? Oxford? <laughs> yeah, of course it's from Oxford. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it'll fix it for you. 
And so um, often the dates are a little bit older than you would think. Right, right. Um, because it, so that's actually that's what Tom was saying. All everything practically needs to be redated because they can go yeah. farther back now. Right. Well, and that's like some of the I know some of the Chauvet dates were dating to like thirty yes. to thirty two thousand yeah. normal. But once you calibrate them, it's more like 35,000, 36,000, 37,000, I believe. So again, but, but having that tree ring that we can use as a reference, basically, that's like our reference guide, and then being able to match them up in such a neat way with the different sequences. I mean, it's, it's, it's the beauty of having all these different confirming methods, which yeah. is so important. Because one, one, as I think it was Jean Claude in my field, and I'm sure other people have said it too, but Jean Claude's one of like, again, the OGs in my field, um, amazing researcher, but he said, you know, one date is not a date. Like, right. you don't, you need other ones to make sure and to confirm that, you know, there isn't contamination. And so the goal always is if you can get multiple types of dating to all give you very similar dates, then you can feel very confident that that's the range of dates. And that's what happened here with White Sands is that they, they've now got three different things they've dated and they're all giving 20 to 23,000. So I think I think that's a pretty solid, we can all feel confident that it wasn't contamination. You know, they, they did all the dating methods well. And, you know, I think that now I, I'd be very curious to know what else is going on in that area around 20, 23,000 years ago. We've got Absolutely. their footprint. Where, where are the people? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we need to find the next. settlements, what they were doing, yes. who they yes. were. Caves. Gotta look at the caves. I know. I want to right? go for art, always. <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, it's a wonderful story, um, and it's it's exciting to really see again, like what's happening with with technology and how it's really opening up the stories for us to understand Absolutely. what's happening across the whole globe. So, speaking of dating methods, I feel like this is like there's a lot of dating methods in this episode. It is, and this episode might be our longest yet. Just oh my gosh, I know, I know. Because we're, we're, we're only on the second story. We're only going but, on the second story right now. Yeah, now we're moving on to the second story. Because we asked, let's move on. And now I think we're talking, at, like, we've got like paleomagnetic dating that we get yes. to bring in. Now, so we're so going to talk about like this. Yes. The podcast episode of dating methods, but not Tinder for scientists. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're sure definitely we're not. <laughs> no, yeah, definitely not. Chronometric dating methods. <laughs> Okay, so, so we're tell going us about the story. Yes, so we are going to jump much farther back. Absolutely, and the other side of the planet again. And the other side of the planet. We're yep. going to return to Africa, where many of our stories do take place, because, of course, that is where our species, yep. that is where our clade, our genus originated. Yep. Yep. And we're going to be traveling specifically to Ethiopia to two million years ago. We're going to be visiting a high plateau. Now, 40 years ago on this plateau, scientists discovered a lower jawbone, a mandible, with yep. some teeth in it. It was clearly a child. And at first, they weren't 100% sure what it was because based on the location high on this high altitude plateau, there really shouldn't have been anything living there honestly no. because of what we know on the evolution of these species even today homo sapiens struggle to live in higher altitudes yes and that's so, with all of our adaptations yes so to yeah. think of a species prior to us existing in a higher altitude is pretty interesting so what happened was it turns out this little fossil this mandible belonged to a homo erectus child oh. and it at a site known as melka kunter melka kunter the melka kunter complex which stretches over several square miles of ethiopian highlands 30 miles from the capital of addis ababa okay and what they are seeing here is a period of occupation at this site where first they're observing the species here, you know, supposedly Homo erectus, using um, old one tools. And that in itself is slightly strange because we typically know Homo erectus to use Acheulean tools. And 
for them to be using old wand tools is a little strange, but the dates do line up because this Homo erectus was almost, I believe, around 1.96, almost 2 million years old is what they believe. Yeah. And this is... I think Acheulean tools, if I'm not mistaken, previously were maybe known at about 1.7 million years old. So almost 300,000 years younger. Yes. So, so that's interesting. Very intriguing, hey? Very intriguing. So what happened is they think they were using old one tools at first. They migrated into this highland area yep. due to climactic forces which is so often a trigger for change and adaptation among any species yep they slowly adapted into using Julian tools this paper is it's not exactly claiming but it's suggesting yep. that this That's site the perfect word yes <laughs> it is suggesting that this site might actually be the first factory i guess you could say yeah for a shulian like tools an origin site or certainly like an yes. origin area kind of thing now this is going to be very hard to prove and of course we find older lithics all over the place all the time yep. most textbooks still will claim that the oldest tool industry is the older one however yep. We now have the Lamequian, which predates it by 700,000 years. Is that the one that goes back to like 3.3 3 million, yes. right? Yes, 3.3, oh, 3.5. Okay. So about that. So they've given it a different name now. and they think it's, it's still not different... 100% official, but they have in papers okay. that have okay. called it the Lamequian tools. Okay, so just for our listeners' benefit here. Okay, so Oldowan slash Lamequian tools, those are more like, these are the very first tool types yes these are your ancestral yeah hominids. you're banging rocks together and you're you're banging rocks yeah, together and you're getting a sharp edge you know they're cobbles they're like little round stones or whatever you're banging them to get like a nice sharp edge but the rest of it's just like a regular old stone and yeah. then they think they were mostly either cutting or bashing or cutting so and it was like one tool fit all kind of thing like they weren't making varieties of tools it was them. one tool fit all that also but they were very one use it seems like like they would use it throw it away then when they needed another tool they would make another Just one make one and uh -huh. use it there was no thought of recycling and repurposing it. yeah there was none of that going on at Sterling. so that's really interesting from a mental cognitive point of view yeah. too hey that idea of like pre-planning, forethought, all those kinds of things. Exactly, um, which is what we see. Right? right, the ability to think ahead, to pre-plan, like, oh, I'm going to need another, I'm going to need this to be sharpened again in three weeks' time, or I should yeah. bring this extra material with me. So they were more just, um, you know, taking advantage of what was around them. So they exactly. were just sort of using as they needed. Um, and then the Acheulean tools, though, are the first ones that we would probably call, like, um, very much very purposeful tools in the sense that like not the other ones were purposeful but they were shaping the entire tool right yes. like they were literally like they wasn't just leaving it stone with one sharp edge they were actually shaping and forming an entire tool which had multiple things you could do with it right so lithics in general is a great window into the yep. behavior and cognitive capacity of our ancestors because yep. like you were saying and like we were saying just bashing rocks together i mean we see macaques doing that. It doesn't. And capuchins. That's and capuchins. Yeah. They're smart. And mean. I know. There's so many of them and they're mean. <laughs> I'm scared. Um, I'm like, oh no. Okay. Here's a story that's totally off. Well, we mentioned capuchins. So no, my, no. We, my community college, Moorpark College, yeah. has a teaching zoo. It's actually <gasps> America's number one teaching zoo. No way. And we have. Do you have capuchins? Capuchins. Capuchins. Am I pronouncing it wrong? It's, it, it's both ways. It, it both okay, ways. Okay. Capuchins, capuchins. I've heard it both. Okay. I don't know which one's right. Okay. We have them. <laughs> they got out one time. Oh, no. All of them. Oh, no. <laughs> and I don't even know how they got them back in, but they terrorized the school for like a month straight. Oh my gosh. It I was love that. this was like decades ago, <laughs> but like it, like they tell the story still. Because like oh. 
like in my um, bioanth 101 class we went to do a primate observation on them we learned how to do yeah. them and they tell the story they're like do not if you see one get out or you see you see something be very careful yeah. and alert someone because if that happens again don't, don't walk you. alone tell yeah, somebody don't walk don't alone approach. at night like they're like it's not the lions you need to be afraid of it's the it's oh the no it's the terrifying little masterminds which are like planning our downfall I yeah swear. <laughs> yeah so much anger in such tiny little bodies hey <laughs> seriously absolutely and that that ratio of brain to body is a little concerning too because they got big brains with big bodies. um but back to our story but yes. yeah but i think that's 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 the idea though but capuchins also do like sort of that kind of on the spot sort of tool making and and so i think you know the big thing to me that came out of the story the big takeaway was a 300,000 years older than previously thought which again up until now we've only ever seen them fully formed at site but fascinating to have a site which has these multiple layers so we yeah. can see change over time which is so important right like exactly. and the idea that there's all the one tools underneath and then 50,000 years later which is a blink in an eye right. by paleontological standards there's a whole new tool type and, and then you know wondering again that idea of like as they say like necessity is the mother of invention and so maybe this more challenging environment they were living in might have made them require tools that were a little more complicated and and, and had a little bit more sort of flexibility as to what they could use them for in order to better survive in that tougher environment. Um, exactly. But, but it, it's intriguing to think that, you know, have they found one of the origin spots of Acheulean tools? Because that's a huge, that was a big step. It is. Big and my, yeah. my whole thing is, you know, in my experience and from what I know, I would not say that there was one origin spot. You know what I mean? I would yeah. assume do you think it's a region. Like, do you think it was maybe well, not even maybe area? a region, but I would just think where Homo erectus existed, and yeah. you know, that ecological need probably existed elsewhere. I would yeah. assume that the tools probably arose in a few places, because I mean, we have, um, in Dominici, yeah, they yeah, are, Georgia. yeah, Dominici in Georgia. That's dating to, let me just confirm. It's 1.8, I think, right? Um, yeah, 1.75. Okay. So that's right around this period. Yeah. Did they have Acheulean tools? That's no? what I'm wondering. I don't remember. I feel like they didn't. I feel, I feel like, like, like they didn't tools. either. Yeah, I feel like they're pre-Acheulean. Because I think I've often, when I'm back when I was an undergrad, um, I, they talk about something called the Mobius line, which was that any right. erectus groups that left before about 1.5 million always had all the one tools. And it was the ones who left after who took the Acheulean's with them. And so the thought was that they'd been invented post that point. Now, maybe it's just that the groups that left hadn't run across the Acheulean people yet, or it, it hadn't, it wasn't something they needed. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, we know so little about that period in general. It's fascinating. Um, second of all, one of the things that jumped out at me with that article as well was that you never find what I call the crime scene. Like, you know, what we really need in order to answer so many of these questions is we literally need, like, you know, a Neanderthal to have a heart attack with, like, something in their hand. And then, <laughs> like, do, do you know what I mean? Like, like it's like we need, we we don't often have the, the hominin fossil material right in association with the tools. Right. And I think that was the other thing that was really unusual and exciting about this was yes. that that mandible was literally was tools. in the tools. And right. so for the very first time, because um, yeah, for listeners who may not know that we often find tools or fossils and, and there's no way to directly associate. So you're kind of guessing that around the same time period, somewhere down the, you know, down the way tools were found, but they're not, in the same site in the same layer so that was also a, a big find for the absolutely field. and just yeah. to go back a little talking about dominici and the yeah. homo rectus that are there which some call homo georgicus because they are slightly different they did okay. not did not have the shulian tools they were so they were still using those tools. simple ones yeah so yes. it's an interesting question about who who invented it when how many times was it invented 
did they share again it right. goes back to theory of mind and how much right. are they sharing between groups exactly. too right yeah so exactly. oh it's fascinating so that's awesome so now let's go to our last story yes before we is, lose exactly. everyone to our talking i know i know, I know. Here's our, we're babbling on about all of our dating methods and so much tool stuff it's so fun though i know um, it's let's let's talk about neolithic art so Paleolithic art, of course, is Stone Age art. Neolithic is the first time period that was right after the transition at the end of the Pleistocene, beginning of the Holocene, so the end of the Ice Age. So yes. normally when we talk about Paleolithic art, um, what's so fascinating is right towards the end of the Ice Age, these are hunter-gatherers, they're living around the world, they're making art which probably reflects their culture in some way or the priorities in their life, and they're doing these things which the art and culture and art you know, everything's kind of intertwined there, right? And they're right, making certain right. kinds of jewelry. They have a certain lifestyle. Neolithic is the first introduction of agriculture. It's also the introduction of pottery in a lot of places. And so we've got a new lifestyle. Um, we've also got a massively changing environment because the ice sheets melted. And the yeah. world is like a different place. Like Northern Europe used to be a massive tundra. Now it's it's green. It's friendly. It's a lot more like the world we're used to seeing today. So different world, different needs, different animals, different ways of, you know, surviving. Now they're staying in place, they're farming and doing things. Um, and, and with it, what we find is that they, their art either A, changes or B, it disappears. Like, like cave art in many parts of Europe, gone. End of the Ice right. Age, it's, it's just, it stops. It's almost like a line in the sand and then there's just no more art. So one exception to that area, though, is actually on the Iberian Peninsula, so Spain and Portugal, where we do have Neolithic art, which is the mm -hmm. continuation. And these are the descendants, um, certainly in some cases. Now, keeping in mind, genetically, we do also have people wandering in from the east and coming up from the Middle East. So we're getting new genetic populations, introducing things as well. So there's definitely a bit of a mix going on here. Um, but from my point of view, what's always been really interesting is trying to understand what happened at the end of the ice age yeah and and what came next because we see them starting to even towards the very end of the ice age they're stylizing more so now now we're right we're now we're now we're in my wheelhouse we're talking about my stuff here but you know <laughs> with the geometric signs in particular but also with the figurative art with the animals and stuff they're more stylized they're, they're more shorthandish they're not often drawing those big beautiful animals like they were anymore right becoming more almost like a more efficient version of communication like you would think if you were trying to impart messages or if you were recording things or so again maybe the reason to do big beautiful animals in caves no longer existed if we were no longer hunter gathering we were doing different things right right, right. so this this particular study really cool um big shout out to my colleagues from the first art team whoop whoop because this <laughs> is their study <laughs> so they're um wonderful bunch of researchers um many of them centered out of spain and portugal and um so this is an area called extremadura it's the center part of spain not a lot of action going on during the paleolithic this was not obviously a very friendly environment at that time but now as we talked about the climates changed this was obviously a more appealing place because i believe there are over a thousand sites now in that they've found in the extremadura region which date to this neolithic era um almost all of the art is what they call schematic mm -hmm. so again right in my lane this is a ton of geometric art or very stylized humans um and and it's a really not that much is actually known about it but this um my my colleagues in this our team here have been doing some fantastic studies there specifically at the Juanita rock shelter where there's over 300 images in 25 panels so wow. really rich site yeah it's a lot and the cool thing is some of those geometric designs, um, and we'll link the article below. So if you want to go look at the pictures, it's pretty Absolutely, cool. Absolutely, yeah. Um, they, they match a funerary site down the road. So a burial site, Neolithic burial site, where there's pottery. And the pottery patterns are the same as what you're seeing on the cave walls. Wow. Which is very intriguing yeah, too, absolutely. right? Yeah. And so um, that also, so this is like an area, again, we just don't know that much about. And so um, what they've been doing is trying to open this area up and better understand, because again, a thousand sites is a lot of sites right. for a group of people we know very little about um, <laughs> because they're, 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 they're post-Ice Age. And um, 
So this particular site is sort of the benchmark for about 35 other sites nearby. And so this is probably part of the Neolithic culture. And what they've been doing, and so we'll talk about one more super nerdy geochemical <laughs> analysis technique today, which is called Raman spectrometry. And so they can use it to actually, it's really similar to like, if you think about, you know, with the exoplanets where they're already always trying to figure out what the chemical signatures yes. are of planets out in space, right? And, and yeah. you can figure out like, oh, this planet has methane and this one has oxygen. So we know the chemical signatures of things. And now this has been turned towards cave painting pigment. Okay. We can figure out the chemical signature of what's in the pigment. And so, again, this was them doing a really cool sort of first big analysis of how, what was the paint recipe? How was it made? Um, you know, are there contaminants in it? What happened? Um, also, I, I didn't see anything in this study, but just for the record, you can also see if there's saliva and things like that in the paint. So right. your paleogenetic Absolutely. dating possibility. <laughs> um, but yeah, so also paint recipes are often specific to cultural groups. So if you can figure out if they're using the same recipe at, say, these 35 caves, it's probably all the same people being taught the same stuff. Right. Which is really fascinating, too. So I think that, you know, for me, the, the big thing I just kind of wanted to to point out was the study was that we, we know so little about this mysterious post-Paleolithic period. Mm -hmm. And so here we've got this area in Spain where there's actually a lot going on. Um, and I mean, keeping in mind, too, that the line in the sand between the Paleolithic and the Neolithic is totally created by us researchers <laughs> so the, the people who live there never got a memo that they went from being you know paleo people to neo neolithic people <laughs> so no. they just carried on um and and so to maybe understand what happened at the end of the ice age and and what happened to their art practices and and how did those become modified and then thinking forward a bit further to writing as well are we starting to see that trend the early transition taking place like we are say in the fertile crest of the middle east where we're starting to see the very first um, proto writing systems form. So I, I'm very intrigued by what what these new sites now that they're getting documented, what they might be able to tell us. Absolutely, and you know, isn't that always the story of what can we learn as we gain new technologies and new data, um, new methods of gaining data and everything along yeah. with that. Yeah, and just realizing that I need more lifetimes than I have, so I need more colleagues because <laughs> <laughs> now I want to go know about Neolithic art in the Extremadura. So yeah, there's so much to yeah. do. It's just amazing. And, you know, for any listeners who may not realize this, there's not actually that many of us in the field. I know. It's like a lot of people think, week. yeah, a lot of people <laughs> think there's just tons of people doing this work no. and that everyone's out there. Oh, my gosh. No, there's so much yeah. left to be done. So, Absolutely. you know, this is where something like this, I'm like, oh, wow, I would love to know what's in those thousand rock shelters. But, you know, <laughs> I, I, I've already like in four different places at once. So I really hope, I really hope somebody decides to take that on. Hint, hint. Yeah. Right, <laughs> seriously, seriously. Come join, hint, us. Hint. come join us on the, not, ooh, come join us on the paleo side. It's not the yes. best side, it's the paleo side. The Love paleo it. side. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not fun. But on that note, we should let our poor listeners go before their brains explode. And we come right. up with some other things that we should run off on. And oh, I know, which it. could happen so easily and so quickly. Oh. Wind changes, we come up with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, with that, we are going to end this episode of the Paleo Post podcast. We hope you had a wonderful time and learned something new and expanded your horizons. For next time, we'll have brand new three or three topics to talk about because there's always more to learn. The wild ride. The wild ride. <laughs> All right, guys. We will see you on the next episode. Bye for now.